Representative Stevens on this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you for your leadership in convening all the hearings that you did and uh, considering all these bills today. Uh, certainly appreciate your leadership uh, in that regard and protecting the families in our Commonwealth. We don't often have an opportunity to vote on legislation that will save lives, but the data shows that today we have that rare opportunity. My bill provides a mechanism for families and law enforcement to act when someone is in crisis and poses an imminent threat to themselves or others while guaranteeing the due process our country was founded upon. This approach began in Connecticut in 1999 when a disgruntled employee went into the lottery headquarters killing several supervisors after he had been passed over for a promotion. Prior to the shooting, co-workers had commented that the man was going to snap one day and his father reported he had been suicidal. In Indiana, the law was sparked when a man who police had previously committed was disarmed, or previously committed and disarmed, killed a his mother and began shooting up the streets of Indianapolis after the police returned his guns to him as required by law. Jake's law, Indiana's extreme risk protection order law, was named for Indianapolis police officer Jake Laird, who was shot and killed responding to the scene. In Oregon, a U.S. Army Special Forces veteran and senior and state senator introduced their ERPO law after his son, a 31-year-old veteran of the U.S. Navy, committed suicide. In Washington, a 23-year-old man described by his mother as depressed and increasingly violent was nonetheless able to legally purchased the firearm he used to kill his 21-year-old stepsister and himself in their family home. In California, a 22-year-old went on a shooting spree, killing six people in Isla Vista before killing himself. The family had applied for an emergency commitment against the gunman three weeks earlier for making homicidal and suicidal threats, but he did not meet the minimum criteria. Teachers, family members, and friends all reported he was withdrawn, depressed, and severely troubled as far back as high school. Today, Pennsylvania families would face the same dilemma. The only way to disarm a loved one in crisis is to involuntarily commit them to a mental institution for up to five days. That's five days taken against your will away from your home, your family, your friends, your job. But that's only if you meet the criteria of having a mental illness. Just yesterday, the Philadelphia Inquirer reported that according to the CDC, less than half of those who commit suicide have a known diagnosed mental health condition. In a study of mass shootings from 2009 to 2016, 42% of the attackers had shown warning signs of violent behavior. But it's not just about mass shootings. Two-thirds of all firearms deaths are suicides, and studies have shown that extreme risk protection orders, uh, order laws in Indiana and Connecticut reduced suicides there by 7.5% and 13% respectively. Extreme risk protection orders were adopted in each of the five states that I listed earlier following horrible tragedies. Since the tragic shooting in Parkland, Florida, at least five more states have adopted them, and more than 25 other states are considering them. From one end of the country to the other, and across the political spectrum, state legislatures are recognizing we need to do more to identify people who pose too serious a risk at that time to possess a firearm. Let's not wait for another tragedy before we act. We can begin saving lives right now by supporting this amendment and then House Bill 2227 and adopting extreme risk protection orders in Pennsylvania. 